Drunk driving, binge drinking, all night ragers. The highest office in the land has attracted a surprisingly large number of heavy drinkers over the years. America's second president, John Adams, achieved many things before entering his presidency. Surprisingly, he may have done many of them while slightly drunk. Adams had a fondness for drinking, but he was especially fond of hard cider, which he once described as refreshing and salubrious. He started drinking it at Harvard and enjoyed it so much that he drank it every day for breakfast for most of his life. A daily splash of booze was so essential for Adams, in fact, that when he was getting ready to sail for France on the U.S. frigate Boston, Adams wrote a packing list for himself that included a keg of rum, a barrel of Madeira, and four dozen bottles of port. During the course of the First Continental Congress, he was also thoroughly inebriated. Martin Van Buren developed a reputation for really holding his liquor. Van Buren, whose presidency was marked by a number of disasters, probably badly needed a drink most of the time, and he was affectionately nicknamed Blue Whiskey Van as a result of his fondness for liquor. According to John R. Bumgarner's The Health of the Presidents, Van Buren was famous for never seeming drunk, even though he drank a great deal. On the other hand, Van Buren seems to have reflected on the dangers of alcoholism, and he once warned his son in a letter, what you may regard as an innocent and harmless indulgence will take you years to overcome in the public estimate. Prone to overindulgence himself, Van Buren drank so much wine, port, and Madeira, he already had a bad case of gout in his 50s. In the 19th century, President James Old Buck Buchanan was known for putting away enormous amounts of liquor and wine. He regularly replenished his supply of whiskey by buying 10 gallons of the stuff at a time, and newspapers from the era frequently referred to Buchanan's seemingly superhuman ability to drink without getting drunk. Famous newspaper mogul and friend of Buchanan, John Forney, once commented, The Madeira and sherry that he has consumed would fill more than one old cellar. He went on to remark that Buchanan typically drank multiple bottles at a single session, but congratulated him for remaining remarkably sober throughout. While Buchanan's demeanor may have remained unchanged by his drinking, his health was affected by his overconsumption of liquor. Later in life, like many other hardcore drinkers, Buchanan was saddled with a crippling case of gout. On paper, Buchanan was great. In practice, he was awful. Warren G. Harding's turbulent presidency is primarily remembered for sleaze, scandals, and illegal liquor. In addition to having extramarital affairs and running a crony government, Harding was a hated hypocrite who enjoyed late-night poker parties accompanied by lashings of boobs. Despite supporting Prohibition when he was in the Senate, during his stint in the White House, Harding continued to drink freely. While in public, Harding complained that Americans were not following the law, but instead supporting bootleggers and relaxing at speakeasies. In private, the president was just as bad. He was not always discreet about it either. He once arrived drunk on whiskey to a meeting with a union leader at the Oval Office. Increasingly worried about being found out, Harding hid his own liquor cabinet in his bedroom for a time to cover his tracks. However, word got around that he was still drinking, which seriously damaged the president's reputation. Although he supposedly attempted to give up drinking for real in 1923, it was too little too late. He could not shake his sleazy image, and to make matters worse, the story broke that members of his corrupt poker circle were actually in cahoots with bootleggers. Thomas Jefferson's drinking habits ran toward the more tasteful end of the spectrum. He was obsessed with wine and wine collecting and wrote endless pages of notes on the subject. Throughout his life, Jefferson bought hundreds of bottles, and on the occasions he ran out, he expressed considerable distress about it. In 1815, for example, he wrote to one wine merchant, Disappointments in procuring supplies have at length left me without a drop of wine. I must therefore request you to send me a quarter cask of the best you have. Wine from long habit has become an indispensable for my health, which is now suffering by its disuse. Rowdy Southerner Lyndon B. Johnson had some dangerous drinking habits that caused a public scandal when they came to light in the 1960s. In 1964, Time magazine broke the story that Johnson had gone out driving, racing down the road at great speed with an open cup of beer in the car. Johnson was transporting a group of reporters at the time, and he threw his hat over the speedometer in a weak attempt to disguise his reckless driving. This shocking episode of drunk driving was no isolated moment to poor judgment. Joseph Califano recalled in his memoir, Triumph and Tragedy of Lyndon Johnson, that he had also seen the president sipping a drink while on the road. Armed with a plastic cup filled with scotch and soda, Califano claims that when the pair went out for a drive, Johnson regularly slowed down to get a refill, stating, Johnson would hold his left arm outside the car, shaking the cup in ice. A secret service agent would run up to the car, take the cup, and go back to the station wagon. There, another agent would refill it with ice, scotch, and soda as the first agent trotted behind the wagon. Then the first agent would run the refilled cup up to LBJ's outstretched arm and waiting hand as the president's car moved slowly along. 
A great many mistakes have been made. Calavano notes that, in general, the president also liked to finish the day with a glass of scotch. However, he finally slowed down and stopped completely when anxiety about the Vietnam War started to get to him. He dropped the scotch, feeling he should remain fully in control of his faculties. It may come as little surprise that the man who ended Prohibition really liked to drink. While Franklin D. Roosevelt did not regularly drink excessively, making a good cocktail was part of his daily routine, and he liked to experiment with new mixtures, sometimes with questionable results. Roosevelt referred to his evening wind-downs as the Children's Hour, a reference to the poem by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. It was a chance for the president to play with the cocktail shaker among friends, and he was known to have forced his bizarre martinis on all in attendance. On one trip, this included Joseph Stalin, who remained unimpressed with the American concoction. Fond of changing the quantity of spirits he used in a completely artless fashion, Roosevelt's grandson Curtis Roosevelt once remarked that the president made the worst cocktails in the world. On the other hand, it is well known that he popularized the Dirty Martini, a tangy version of the drink that's made with brine, and he can be credited with the invention of the Haitian Libation, a mixture of dark rum, orange juice, egg white, and brown sugar. It's disputed how heavy Roosevelt's drinking actually was on the regular, but he typically liked to have two or three cocktails in the evening after dinner. His most notorious drinking bouts took place in the company of his friend and ally from across the pond, Winston Churchill. The pair allegedly worked late into the night, accompanied by Churchill's signature brandy and cigars, events it took Roosevelt many days to recover from. Often remembered as one of America's least successful presidents, Franklin Pierce's life was as depressing as his term in office was. Franklin, who upon losing his party's nomination, famously declared, there's nothing left but to get drunk, was not just a heavy partier, but rather had severe alcoholism, an addiction that destroyed his life and well-being. Pierce's very religious wife helped him contain his drinking for a short while, but he would continually hit the bottle when life got tough. Although he had a brief flirtation with the temperance movement in the 1840s, Pierce never really got over his addiction, and he was crushed by the pressures of his life in office. The death of his only living son around the time he was elected as president pushed him to start drinking heavily again, and his group of very drunk friends made it difficult for him to quit. When Pierce retired, his drinking also got increasingly severe. John R. Bumgarner reports in his book, Health of the Presidents, that alcoholism seems to have run in Pierce's family, and that the president suffered numerous complications from his drinking throughout his life. In the end, the bottle ultimately killed him. He died of cirrhosis of the liver in 1869. America's first president set the standard for heavy drinking for every president after him. At the climax of the Constitutional Convention of 1787, George Washington threw a party along with 55 others and ran up a bar tab for 45 gallons of alcohol, paying the 2018 equivalent of $15,400, according to the Washington Post. Outside of special occasions, Washington was still a pretty big drinker. Washington Irving writes in George Washington A Biography that the president's daily routine consisted of a beer or cider followed by several glasses of Madeira after dinner. Beer was a particular favorite of his, so much so that he began brewing his own. But he also opened up a whiskey distillery at his place in Mount Vernon for making both rice and brandies. One of the beer recipes he left behind has since been recreated by the Coney Island Brewing Company, but sadly had a limited run. God bless George Washington! Ulysses S. Grant was an extremely heavy drinker who appears to have crossed the line into alcohol addiction for at least part of his life. In 1854, he was forced to resign from the army for his excessive boozing, and many people believe he was drunk throughout the entirety of the Civil War. Grant most likely developed his habit during his stint as a young man in the California Infantry, a place that had an extreme drinking culture even by the low standards of the day. A lieutenant who met Grant there once remarked, there was not a day passed but what these officers were drunk at least once, and mostly until the wee hours of the morning. Grant's fellow soldiers from this era went on to record that Grant was often reduced to a childlike state after just a few glasses, and clearly could not handle his drink. Today, historians are divided on just how drunk Grant was later in life, and whether he really was drinking before important battles. Whenever Grant struggled during the Civil War, the press tended to blame his alcohol, which seems to have been a recurring issue. At the Battle of Shiloh, for example, and during the Vicksburg Campaign, rumors about Grant's drinking were placed center stage. Others, including Grant's wife, dismissed the stories as malicious. Either way, by the time he accepted the sober office of the presidency, he appeared to have become more or less boots-free. President George W. Bush quit drinking for good after years of alcohol abuse and bad behavior. Although it is debatable whether or not Bush had an alcohol addiction, he definitely drank too much, and his love of getting smashed won him the disapproval of his friends and family. Bush's drinking habits went back to at least his college days at Yale, where he was celebrated for his drunken frat boy activities. 
Some of Bush's friends have testified that the former president was a binge drinker who was unable to stop once he started. By the age of 30, Bush hit a real low point when he was pulled over for drunk driving. His DUI got him fined and his license temporarily suspended. But it also became major political news when it was uncovered by the press during his campaign for president in 2000. I'm not proud of that. It wasn't the only time his drunken antics became public knowledge either. In 1986, Bush was involved in another infamous incident when he walked up to a Wall Street Journal reporter in public and, while drunk, said, You son of a bitch, I saw what you wrote. We're not going to forget this. Unlike some drunken presidents, however, Bush decided he had to change. At the age of 40, having become increasingly religious, Bush quit drinking for good. Many of you know that I quit drinking uh, alcohol in 1986, and it was the right decision for me to make. 